uh, the geometric forms, triangles, squares, shapes that condense and form different shapes. And when we're doing experiments, these shapes generally correlate with the intended target. And of course, there are sounds, humming, buzzing, or there are silences. Now, you might look at that and say, well, that sounds like some of the UFO experiences, and that's correct, too. So I'm pointing out that these experiences can occur at other kinds of saturations. Now, sometimes in order to look at boundaries of perception, um, working with a colleague that lives in Orlando, Florida, I like to use very simple projects like this eye test chart. Um, so the page from this optical book is on the left, is target. This is her response on the right which actually correlates very well with the vertical lines, except it shifts. And that was the whole intention of the eye test, to shift from one spot to the other. Uh, but then, like in most remote viewing situations, she turns this into an animal or a farce. So the, the tendency to analyze is ever-present. Um, here was the same project, only in a dream state. And in this case, the lines are very close to correlating with the intended target. But again, there's a shift into interpreting, and which, are, which in this case, is no interpretation. They're just pure lines. Um, I like to work with the future. And my specialty, you might say, is trying to perceive the pictures that appear on newspapers three days in the future, three or five days in the future. And th these are two pictures that appeared on a local newspaper three days after the dream. And I always sketch the ending of the dream, which is the most reliable and the most accurate. There were two pictures on that page, the one on top and then the one on the bottom. The, the event had not occurred at the time of the dream. The event occurred three days later, two days later, and was published three days later. On the top, you will notice that this doesn't really look like the picture, but it was a sense of falling it was a sense of something like a parachute, uh, some kind of moisture coming down, and it, it captured the essence, the dynamics of the picture, um, including some very specific details of the shadow, the shadow that's right below the dog, uh, that light dark pattern. In this case, the accuracy was off, but the, the timing seemed to be on in terms of the momentum. On the bottom picture, the timing is off, but the accuracy of the picture is better because I have to presume that the dog actually did catch that in the next frame. Remember, these pictures did not exist at the time of the dream. Um, the event occurred three days later. So there's a slight hint of an uncertainty principle here. Accurate in time, uh, trade-off in position. Accurate in position, trade-off in time. I've seen this over the years in some of the projects I worked on. I like this one. It's a painting of a Peruvian shaman um, after uh, one of his shamanic journeys uh, at drinking the brew Arahusca, I think I pronounced that right, with the drug DMT, and I don't quite know how to pronounce it, dimethyl triphetamine. Now, in this, what's interesting here is the center top is a spacecraft. That's what he describes as a spacecraft. And those are aliens or people that inhabit that spacecraft that come out to meet him. Uh, there's a lot of cultural stuff, there's a lot of archetypal stuff uh, in here as well. But Peruvian shamans tend to have a tendency to see UFOs. So if you want to see a UFO, I suppose you should go to the Amazon. So what have I come to after all these years? I think that some UFOs are internal imagery, and they're generated totally by the individual. This could be some kind of an archetypal, archetypal thing. It could be something from the collective unconscious. It could be some kind of buried, hidden need that the individual has to have the experience. There are also some from terrestrial sources. You might be in a position, a position or close to a high power magnetic field or electromagnetic uh, radar uh, generation that might generate some of these. But even more significant, some of these can be transferred from one person to another by intention. I know a lot of cases where somebody sees UFOs when somebody who has good psychic abilities say, look up in the sky, there's a UFO, and they see them. But they don't all see the same thing. So there's a transfer, and I think in the Hindu tradition, you call that Shakti, the transfer of energy, the transfer of imagery. In the abductions, I tend to think that a lot of them, if not most of them, are lucid dreams, out-of-body experiences, or the one that's really more vivid than others, the transpersonal one. And I believe that many of them have trauma links, and some of them might be linked to the drug DMT, which is some researchers suspect is generated by the pineal, pineal gland. And of course, some are unexplainable, and you've heard a lot about that so far. Implications? I think that there really is a collective imaginal domain that does have an existence. It's real, 
in a psychological sense, but not in a literal sense. It somehow has a reality all to itself. I also suspect now that space-time is represented somewhere. There's a representation of space-time, a counterpart somewhere that's like holo a holographic pattern, uh, which can record and also code information in space-time. And that through our conscious, subconscious mind, we can interact with it, providing the needs and the intentions are focused properly. Sometimes it's a subconscious thing, sometimes it's an intentional thing, a planned thing, like in remote viewing, for example. And the, I also think at this stage that the two biggest problems of psi in terms of trying to reconcile it from a scientific point of view are precognition and macro PK. And if you think about space-time being represented in some representation, representational space, then I'm beginning to think that precognition is a projection feature of that space-time. So that what we perceive as the future is not really in the future, but it's now and projected from all known information that's in this representational space. Macro PK then follows, because now with the representational space, then it's a matter of somehow interacting with the forms, the energy forms, whatever, that are in the representational space and changing them around and then uh, quitting or then uh, leaving the experience or changing the shapes. And of course, I think it's also important to keep in mind that insights from individual experiences are important, but keeping in mind that each one has a different sensing and a different interpretation, which totally changes uh, from individual to individual. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Someone got through it. Questions on the yeah. side? All right. Questions? Okay, questions. Did I see a hand? Here's one in the back. This, my question or, or observation addresses but a small part of what you uh, illustrated. The, uh, the point that connected for me, both in terms of your <clears throat> near-death experience and the, the wounding that sometimes appears following a, a traumatic uh, night inside your town, uh, suggested Ian Stevens' work with uh, past life uh, uh, carryover, uh, for, for instance, if there was a traumatic death and some I injury had occurred to a part of the body in the process, that, the, that birthmarks would show up on people uh, in, in sessions where they were uh, re-examining this material. And if, the, if, the, if there is such a thing as reincarnation, then the dream state between lives might not be that different from that uh, between uh, the nighttime and daytime uh, for allowing for that kind of a transmission. Uh, do you have any comment on that? I think you're right on on that. Um, and whatever, I use the term imaginal or collective unconscious, but you can add other terms to that, some kind of transitional stage or phase, some, some non-reality domain, but yet it's very real. No, I can relate to that, and I think there's something to it, there's something to your concept there. Yes. Uh, I got a question, that picture that you had uh, from Peru. Yeah. I th believe the substance they're using is ayahuasca. Yeah, this, it's... Having it's dealt good. with the uh, curanderos there, found that the... When you talk to them, we talk about separate states mm -hmm. of consciousness, and you've talked about waking and sleep. Mm -hmm. When you talk with the Corodellos, it's like these states are contiguous. I mean, they just move mm -hmm. smoothly between them. I just wonder if you could comment on, you know, wh why is it we have a distinct separation? They see no separation at all and seem to move fluidly. Yes, the uh, practice shaman apparently does that. You know, I sometimes wonder if they would need to indulge in any kind of brew. Uh, but uh, the beginners, the, the apprentices, appear to be able to uh, need that thing. So uh, what the shamans in Peru and other places do is very similar to the dream yoga approach uh, from Tibet and, and uh, that part of the country. Uh, they're different terms, but the ultimate goal is to have this continuous awareness, whether you, you're so-called asleep or not, you know, uh, the continuous one last, awareness. One last question. I wonder if you could put back that diagram, that colored diagram from the uh, the one with the UFOs, the color that you showed the uh, 
Um, I guess it's a 